The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime. Today, we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough, as well as across New York City. Coming up on today's show, we go front and center discussing coping tips for parents that are concerned about managing their children's anxiety during these troubled times. Then afterwards, we'll learn about a study on the health concerns of first responders of the World Trade Center site on 9-11. And then we're going to talk about ways to diagnose endometriosis and some common symptoms to be aware of. We'll give you more details about that a little later on in the show. And then finally, we'll discuss the work the Food Bank of Central New York City is doing in their Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. So we want you to stay connected to us because guess what? Open begins starting right now. to open a one and only show that opens the Bronx of the world right to you. I am your host, Darren Jaime, and we're glad to have you with us. Listen, we also want to welcome our viewers who are on, watching on Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is being broadcast live simultaneously on our MNN channel. If you want to follow us, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. Number one, of course, you can go to our website at bronxnet.org and our social media platforms at bronxnet TV. There you can stay connected and find out the latest happenings here on Open as well as Bronxnet Television. Well, a lot has certainly been going on through the course of the past week. We're going to take you through a couple of things with our Bronx updates. We start off with COVID-19 news. New York State Governor Kathy Hochul and state health officials provided an update on where the state stands in the fight against COVID-19. The BA.2 variant has been a dominant strain since February, and although cases are on the rise, the governor says she's not yet sounding the alarm. Now, Governor Hochul is encouraging people to continue getting boosted and tested if they do have symptoms. The state's overall positivity rate is around 2%, which is a huge decrease since January when it was at 23%. State health officials stated this new variant does not appear to be spreading as rapidly in the United States as compared to other countries. Well, in other news, Mayor Eric Adams unveiled a new executive order aimed at strengthening fire safety enforcement and outreach just after two months when the Twin Peaks fire killed 17 Bronx residents. Now, Mayor Adams stated the order will increase coordination between the FDNY and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. The goal for inspectors with HPD to be able to identify safety violations earlier and in turn save lives. Now the HPD will provide the FDNY with access to all fire safety violations and records since January of last year. The executive order has the support of several elected officials, both on the local as well as the federal levels. Well, that's all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We want you to stay connected, connected to us, so don't go anywhere. Open continues right after this.
if you're watching the news lately, it seems as though every day can be progressively worse when it comes to news coverage. The Ukraine bombings, the new BA.2 COVID variant, and economic turmoil. Well, people have been cooped up in the house for about two years now, and a lot of them, children, families, experiencing high levels of stress and anxiety. Well, how do you deal with that? Well, our next guest is a part of a behavioral health team at VNSNY and is here today with some coping strategies for Bronx families. We're pleased to have sharing with us right now, Senior Social Work Assistant, Denise Santana of VNSNY. And Denise, thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's good to be here. Well, Denise, as I said in the open, I think a lot of us are really trying to grapple with what's going on in the world today, uh, particularly with all of the domestic turmoil, international turmoil. But give us from a social worker's perspective, uh, what kind of things you're seeing on your end? It's a good question that you're asking, uh, Darren. Um, yes, there's a lot going on for children and their families these days. Um, news headlines are stressful, Ukraine, new COVID outbreaks um, overseas and here. Um, people are stressed from working remotely and many people feel like they're at the end of their rope. Um, we see a huge increase in, in stress since COVID began. Um, what we are seeing at the Friends Clinic is that these concerns don't follow the the stream of spikes and dips in the overall COVID cases in the Bronx. Instead, they are persistent conditions that ultimately manifest themselves in ways that are unhealthy for both the mind, body. Um, for example, um, spacing out, um, increased levels of anxiety, um, also um, quote unquote doom scrolling, which is a term for um, going into social media or um, getting on the internet, on websites and just scrolling for answers to things that are going on in the world, particularly what's going on with Ukraine, um, just scrolling scrolling um, endlessly in search for answers. And instead what it, what it does is it increases the level of anxiety. Yeah. And so when we have children and we've got families who are trying to cope and deal with this stress that's out there, what advice do you have for someone that's actually trying to cope and overcome amidst all these troubled times? Well, one thing I would say that now that the weather's getting better, it's springtime encouraging um, the youth and kids' families to go out more. Um, you know, um, talking to someone, um, extending yourself. Um, also, if you feel the need to um, want to some type of support, with um in terms of the ukraine you know there's websites there's things you can do there's there's um organizations um there's churches there's com community organizations that you can um, get involved in just so that you can be a part of something and 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 show some support yeah and for yourself i want to say also a happy social workers month this is the month where we celebrate uh social workers what's it mean for you to be uh, a social worker particularly at a time like this Thank you. Um, what it means to me is, well, it just means to be of support, um, lending an ear, offering um, different ways of, of managing certain stressors, managing traumas, um, finding healthy ways to be able to express verbally or even like finding new skills that can offer of beneficial impact, positive impact. On, on anyone in terms of, of their growth and their mental health. And for you, uh, tell us a little bit because you're, you're pretty busy and boots on the <laughs> ground with this work. Uh, so what exactly do you do? What's the job of a social worker? Basically what I do is um, I offer care for at-risk adolescents um, within the organization. Um, they are home-based. We do comprehensive clinical assessments. Um, we offer education for family members and other organizations and um, just um, different areas of the community. Yeah. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how to get this assistance because you may have a family member, may have a child, may have someone that's really dealing with anxiety and stress and having uh, trouble coping. What are some of the avenues that a person can go in terms of seeking out assistance? Well, in terms of seeking out assistance to um, through VNSNY, and that's a good, that's um, very good that you mentioned that, Karen. Um, one thing that they can do is they can um, place a referral 
um, that can be done either through schools, through a doc, um, go on to vnsny.org. Um, they can also call the Friends Clinic. Um, you can call the Friends Clinic at 718-742-7000 and someone will be more than happy and, and ready to assist. And so yeah. During this COVID crisis, I mean, a lot of people have definitely talked about being indoors. Isolation has been huge. Stress has been huge. Uh, anxiety has been huge. What's it been like coming through your doors over the course of the last couple of years? Of course, not everybody could come through the doors because we had to do a lot of stuff virtually. But have you seen an increase in the need for services, particularly during this time? Yes, um, there have been an increase in the need for services. Um, Things that I have seen that, that I have that we have observed um, in the agency are things like again like um, increased anxiety, um, depression, uh, sense of worry, um, sometimes even lack of motivation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Darren, um, spacing out. You know, um, kids often tend to to daydream, but sometimes if it's like longer than usual or it just seems like it's it's interfering with their daily routines and activities you know those are things that you definitely want to look out for and you know i'll speak to to the child about it and just ask questions and and offer that support yeah speak to me about our young people because when we talk about our young people hearing our young people deal with stress and anxiety, somebody says that's something that's just for adults, right? That's that's something that older people are dealing with. But as we look and we find uh, between the suicide rate, between people trying to uh, committing themselves to drugs, uh, a lot more of our young people, it seems, are going through uh, in such a way that many times, I think we as adults and maybe a larger community really don't even recognize the amount of stress that there's, that's actually impacting their lives. Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because, you know, there's stress can manifest itself in different in a variety of different ways in children. Um, and I gave a few examples of that. Um, the child doesn't usually come out and say that they're experiencing stress. Um, so it's, it's, it's very important to keep an eye out for changes in behavior. Um, another thing that that can help is just um, assuring them they're not alone. That there is support out there and that there is someone that they can talk to. Yeah. And I think that's the best thing to help uh, anybody to know that they're not, they're not alone and they really, you know, have somebody that they can reach out to. Once again, would you do me a favor and just share with some of our people how they can get in touch and how they can get some of these resources that can better assist them? Because I know there are a lot of people who are really uh, literally uh, under the gun and feeling the weight of uh, weight of the world today. And you look on television, of course, we're a media uh, organization, so I know uh, the images that sometimes we depict, uh, it can be sometimes uh, quite burdensome on somebody's life. Sure, absolutely. So um, you can actually reach out to VNSNY through vnsny.org website, or you can call um, the Friends Clinic, which is 718-742-7100, uh, and there's an agent there who will be readily available to provide any information that's, that's needed. Yeah. So as we celebrate Social Work Month, I wanna close with asking you, what do you find to be the best part of your job? Thank you for asking me that. That's a, that's a really great question. Um, I think um, for me personally, it's um, providing that sense of support. Um, feel like uh, empathy is something that is very important, but also along with that comes responsibility. And it's the responsibility to ensure that, that people are okay and that people are, are, are receiving support and that there's resources out there. Um, and just to know that we're here for one another. You know, we're all connected, we're all connected. We're here for one another and you're making a difference. So Denise, thank you so much for being with us here uh, on Open, sharing a lot about the work of social work, particularly amongst our youth in a time like this. And uh, again, happy Social Work Month to you and thanks for being with us. Thank you so much, I appreciate this.
All righty. Denise Santana is our guest here on Open, talking about social work. As we are saying again, happy Social Work Month to all those who work in the field. Now, I want to let you know, if you want more information, please visit their website, vnsny.org, and then also follow them on Facebook and Instagram at vnsny. We encourage you, please don't go anywhere. We still have more show. Open continues coming up right after this. Back to the show. The collapse of the World Trade Center during the 9-11 attacks exposed first responders and nearby residents to high levels of dust and gases. A recent study published reported results of mutation in the blood cells after analyzing genes in blood samples from the responders. Now joining us to tell more details is the Associate Director of Translational Science at the NCI designated Albert Einstein Cancer Society and Professor of Medicine and Development and Molecular Biology at Einstein, Dr. Amit Verma. And uh, that's a lot for one title, but he's got it all under control. Dr. Verma, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Darren. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. And so you did a, a, a study that was pretty much dealing with 9-11, first responders, and the after effects. So give us a little bit more about what the study uncovered. Yes, sure. Happy to. So we uh, have been collecting blood samples from first responders that participated in the World Trade Center cleanup. Uh, when the buildings came down, you know, they were firefighters, brave firefighters and EMS workers and police force workers who were at the cleanup saving lives and, you know, helping with the rescue efforts. And they were exposed to a lot of particulate matter and dust that came down when the buildings disintegrated. A lot of those dust particles contained harmful chemicals. So we have an ongoing collaboration with the Fire Department of New York, FDNY. Uh, Dr. David Prezant, the Chief Medical Officer of FDNY is a colleague of mine, a friend of mine, who also is a faculty member at Montefiore here with me. 
we have collected blood samples from first responders and done these high depth sequencing tests on them to look for mutations. For comparison, we looked at firefighters from Nashville, Tennessee and from Washington, DC. And when we compared these results, we found that the first responders at the World Trade Center site had mutations in their blood cells that were elevated when compared to other firefighters. So they were about two to three times more likely to have a mutation in their blood cells when compared to the control group of firefighters. So that was our main finding. This is a pilot study. We analyzed about 481 first responders and 250 odd control samples. And we are now starting to sequence about 1,000 to 2,000 more samples. And you asked about what are the implications? You know, there's broad implications. These mutations can tell you whether a person is at a higher risk of developing blood cancers in the future. So we're trying to catch these blood cancers before they become full blown. You know, the best chance of curing cancer when you treat it at an early stage. So, so we want to catch early signs of blood cancer and intercept them before they become full blown. There yeah. is another, sorry. Oh, no, 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 no I, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you uh, jump on and continue in a second. But I wanted to ask that question because hearing that is, you know, news. And so if there's a family member, if there's somebody out there that's connected to a first responder or a first responder themselves that were involved, what, what's the process? What should they be doing given the fact that they found, you, you found these mutated blood cells? This is a great question. So, so I think anybody who was exposed in the first few days, uh, you, you know, if you look at the data, the first six days at the site were the, were the days when the most exposure was, was experienced by first responders and residents. Uh, this exposure caused so much inflammation in the body that we think that may be driving these mutations to, to come up in the blood. This is a simple blood test, actually. You know, this is a blood test, uh, which is called as a sequencing, DNA sequencing analysis. Uh, we do it all the time for patients with blood cancers. When you have a blood cancer, this test is paid off by the insurance, uh, covered by insurance. So, so this test can tell you whether you have mutations in one of the genes that we examine with this test. And there is no risk, uh, you know, if you have a family member who was not exposed to the disaster, but, you know, was, was related to a first responder, there's no risk to the family member. But there is a certain risk to the, to the person who was at the site. And that's mm -hmm. our broad implication that maybe after our pilots, you know, study is noticed by, by the health authorities and by administrators, this will lead to the federal authorities covering this particular test for the broad first responder population. Talk to me for a second about this. When we talk about uh, understanding the possibility of having these mutated blood cells, first responders are out there. Some of them have not been tested. What is the process for them to go and get the testing to find out whether or not they actually have these mutated cells? Is it a simple process, something that can be done to their local doctor? Yeah, it's a great question. Right now, it's being uh, done as a research test. So if you're a first responder, uh, part of the FDNY, you know, the Dr. Prezant's team at FDNY uh, can see you in their Brooklyn office. I think all first responders go there for an yearly checkup where you can get a tube of blood uh, taken and it can be sent to us and we can do the test easily. For the broader population, you can go to your local doctor and request it. You know, they will probably have to talk to insurance to get it approved. So right now that's the mechanism. But what we hope for, Davran, is that after we, 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 have, we have actually published these studies, they came out a week ago, that the Federal World Trade Center program gives their approval to get this test covered. And then this can be done in any doctor's office. So that's that's the hope for the future. Yeah. So I know that Einstein and Montefiore have done some testing and have also done some research. Talk to us about what else you've done in connection with the World Trade Center and uh, 
how that might be interesting to our viewers. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. You know, we did a study, we published a study about three years ago showing that another uh, blood cancer called myeloma can actually be detected. The early signs of myeloma can be detected in the blood from first responders. And the risk of this is two times more than what is expected in the general population. So now I'm happy to report that test is actually covered by the Federal World Trade Center authorities. Anybody can do it, anybody can get it done. We are also looking to see whether these blood mutations also uh, increase your risk of heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, all of these inflammatory diseases. So, so what we can do if we detect this, we are gonna call you to the clinic. We're gonna do a whole preventive checkup, you know, look at the heart, look at the lungs, comprehensively look at the bone marrow, make sure you don't have early signs of cancer. And these are some of the plans that we have for, for these first responders who have a positive test. And you will see a few more you know, studies from our group at Montefiore and Einstein coming out with some of these, these themes in the near future. When you look back at the study and the research, was there anything that really stuck out to you? I mean, we know the, 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 the mutated blood cells, that's one. Were you astounded or taken aback by anything that you, uh, anything else that you were able to uncover? Yeah, I think, you know, the extent was a little bit surprising. You know, we did expect some mutations because the exposure was really bad. But, uh, you know, seeing them at two to three times the rate of what you expect was a little bit, um, you know, higher than what we thought. And I think, um, you know, now we're gonna test the broader population. We have another 1500 samples we're testing right now. Let's see what the results are. We would of course hope that these rate of mutations come down. That would be, that would make me happy. But uh, I think the rate, it's definitely, you know, there, the, the, the rate of these mutations in these first responders is concerning and we have the ability to intervene at an early stage to prevent them from transforming into full-blown cancers. Yeah, have you heard anything from either the public or uh, others in your field about the results of your research and what that's actually been? I think these results were very visible and because of the broad implications, there are a lot of people living in lower Manhattan that were exposed to this dust cloud uh, there are certain other exposures, Darren, uh, like, you know, people exposed to smoke, uh, inhalation, burn pits. I mean, firefighters in general, there are so many broad implications to this research. So we have heard a lot of uh, uh, feedback from people who want to do similar studies in different populations. And I think we, we have the opportunity to collaborate and help them do these studies. Uh, well, Dr. Verma, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Of course, we're going to follow this. And uh, if you do have more information, please don't hesitate to come back and let us know. Very interesting finding about, about these mutated blood cells and those uh, that were 9-11 first responders. Of course, our thoughts and prayers go out to those families. But thank you uh, for the research and for your findings. As I sure, I'm sure that uh, a lot of families and uh, those who've been impacted uh, will be greatly appreciative of the work that's being done. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darren. And I want to thank all the first responders, you know, these really brave individuals who basically, you know, went in without caring about their health. And we, we have to do everything in our power to help them, you know, navigate their health issues. Yeah, Dr. Amit Verma, I say ditto to that. And hopefully uh, they will actually get tested and hopefully we can uh, be able to catch some things and hopefully be able to save some lives the way that they were on the front, front lines for us. So thank you so much, Dr. Mitt Verma, uh, and we're pleased to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. Appreciate it. All righty. Well, we want to let you know, if you want more information about this and other things, please visit the website, einsteinmed.edu. And of course, you can get all the information that you need to know there. Listen, we do have more show. We don't want you to go anywhere. Open continues coming up right after this. We built a media network for you. Bronxnet TV. Come learn in your new state-of-the-art studios at Lehman College. At Mercy College. And coming soon to the South Bronx in the Hub. Inspire with your stories, culture, history. Your Bronx on Bronxnet. Engage with us. Connect with us at your channels and at Bronxnet.tv. Learn. 
Engage. Inspire. BronxNet TV. From the Bronx to the world. <laughs> BronxNet. <laughs> when taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. Welcome back to the show. Endometriosis affects approximately 176 million women worldwide, regardless of their ethnic and social background. Now, endometriosis is also a common yet poorly understood disease, striking women of any socioeconomic class as well as race. Now, joining us to share more details, we've got the Associate Fellowship Director of Minimally Invasive Gynecologic Surgery at Montefiore and Assistant Professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Dr. Carrie Pluniak. And uh, Dr. Carrie, thank you for being with us. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really um, happy to be here to talk about endometriosis. Yeah, you had that large title. I want to make sure I got it all right. There, oh, but thank you so thank much. You. No, thank you. And, and having this conversation about endometriosis, when we talk about it, as we said, it's something that sometimes uh, many people are not so familiar with. Yeah, um, we do know that many people aren't familiar with it, both um, you know, patients in our general population, but as well as healthcare providers. And so there's often a really long delay between symptoms, even bringing those symptoms to a doctor and getting to diagnosis. Yeah. So for the average person who doesn't know, let's introduce them to exactly what is endometriosis. Yeah, so endometriosis is where we have tissue that's like the endometrium, which is um, the lining of the uterine cavity tissue like that ends up outside the uterine cavity. Um, so most often in the pelvis, on the ovaries and on the pelvic organs is the most common location. And when we talk about it is uh, diagnosis. Is it hard to diagnose? Is it something that, you know, the average person will be able to say this is that or talk to us about how you get to the diagnosis? It's really interesting. So the real true diagnosis is made with surgery almost always. 
Um, but we can use symptoms and history to have a really high suspicion and even just uh, start treatment before having that surgical diagnosis. Yeah, you brought the word symptoms and for many people, uh, give us a walkthrough as to what are some of the common symptoms that a person has when it comes to endometriosis? Most commonly, and what people, if they've heard about it, will probably know about is painful periods. Um, there's a lot of different cultural perceptions around what a period should be and how taboo it is to talk about periods in general. Um, but if we see someone who's missing school or missing work because of pain around their periods, that's really should be a red flag and should um, people should bring that up to their doctor. But it can also come with other symptoms, pain with intercourse, pain with sex, um, could be infertility or could be no symptoms at all. So several symptoms to, for people to uh, be aware of. We hear, uh, and, you know, commonly a lot of myths and we hear a lot of things that are associated with it. So let's take a few seconds if we can to maybe look at some of these myths and some of the stereotypes that have been associated with this and how can we can possibly can debunk those. So what are the most common myths that you hear when it comes to endometriosis? Hmm, the most common myths, you know, I think there's a lot of fear around contraception and that contraception can cause a variety of different problems. Um, we do see that most hormonal contraceptive methods actually treat a lot of the symptoms. Um, but there are some myths around hormonal contraception causing infertility or causing a multitude of things. And really, we the things that are on the market now are actually very safe and effective and, and have no causative um, blame here um, when, we, when it comes to endometriosis. Yeah. Many times when we talk about uh, particular issues and or diseases, there's always these health disparities. You can talk about high blood pressure, anxiety prevalent in the African-American community. But when we talk about endometriosis and it comes to women, it seems as though that it's just pretty blanket across the board. Am I correct? Yeah, we know that overall one in 10 women uh, have endometriosis. Um, and so it's very, very prevalent, um, but is one of those neglected diseases that we often see in women's health, unfortunately. Um, and so women often take on lots of burdens around the house and may forego their own medical care for care for their family and um, other, other priorities. So we do see this as, um, often neglected kind of across socioeconomic uh, strata. Yeah. So let's talk about treatment for a moment. If a person is diagnosed with endometriosis, uh, what are the common treatments? Are there several available? There are many available, and it really depends on um, symptoms and fertility goals. Um, but again, hormonal contraception tends to be first line. Many of the methods we have available um, prevent or suppress ovulation or cycling um, and can really help with symptoms. And often that's all that's needed, um, but it really just depends on the patient and their fertility goals. You, you spoke a little earlier about pain and how pain can be prevalent in a, in a potential patient uh, with endometriosis. What about that pain? How, how sharpening is it? is it? Is it really a debilitating pain? It really depends on the patient. Um, some patients have no symptoms. Some patients only have symptoms with their menses or leading up to their menses, um, right up to their period. So it really depends. Um, but often we do see patients who have endometriosis may often have irritable bowel syndrome or painful bladder syndrome. What we think about as chronic overlapping pain conditions that can all affect the abdominal pelvic organs. Um, so really getting a very thorough history for these patients and kind of treating all of the diseases that might be, um, might be ongoing for them holistically is really important. Yeah. And, and is this one of those diseases that run through the family line? We hear sometimes, you know, being checked for this, being checked for that. Is it something that goes through the family line? We do. We do see that sometimes it clusters in family and there is some, um, there is some genetic component there. So when we talk about treatment, obviously uh, that's one thing, but getting detected and finding out more about that. Uh, testing, how often should a person go to possibly uh, receive testing if they feel that this is their case? Yeah, if they think this is their case, they should really bring it up with 
any provider they see, but ideally with a OBGYN um, or someone that's doing their annual gynecologic care. Um, and if they don't feel that they are being adequately heard or anything like that, then they should, um, they can seek another provider. But there's also good patient information out there. Endometriosis.org is a great website, a good resource for um, patients with reputable sources. And give me a little bit about the correlation between uh, endo endometriosis and scar tissue, because I understand there, there is a little correlation there. Yeah, we do see, um, it really depends on um, the severity of the disease. There can be just minimal scar tissue, but it can um, be pretty advanced and involve scar tissue that really glues sometimes the other pelvic organs, bladder, bowel, rectum, ovaries to the uterus and to the other pelvic organs. So the scar tissue can be advanced, um, but I don't wanna scare people. Not everybody has that, um, that advanced disease and sometimes it's pretty minor, um, but surgery does have a role in treatment, really in removing as much endometriosis as we can. Um, as we can. And how does it work in the area of fertility? Because uh, we hear, uh, it does affect, you know, you can have painful periods, things of that nature. Is there some sort of fertility uh, uh, consequence as, oppo as opposed to this? There are. Um, so we, we don't see infertility with all of the patients who have endometriosis, but it is a common reason um, that causes uh, infertility. It is a complex issue um, and really depending on the location of the endometriosis, we have data to say, you know, it's really good to go uh, remove this endometriosis, whereas if it's at this location, maybe not. So it is a very complex, um, it is a complex question, um, but we do see a correlation, unfortunately, between endometriosis and having trouble getting pregnant. Yeah. And before we go, talk to me uh, one more time about treatment. When we talk about treatment and those persons that have to endure that, uh, is this treatment a lifelong treatment or is there the possibility that this can just go away? So typically we do recommend, um, we do recommend treatment throughout the um, reproductive lifespan. So symptoms go along with periods most often and they resolve after menopause. Um, and so it's not lifelong treatment typically, just from you know, uh, diagnosis um, through the age of average menopause or when that person does go through menopause. Um, but we do, even after surgery to remove all visible disease, we still recommend hormonal treatment most often um, until 50, early 50s. Dr. Kari Pluniak, thank you so much for being with us and sharing with us a little bit more about endometriosis. I think our viewers uh, have learned a lot today and certainly, hopefully, uh, if they're feeling some of these uh, symptoms that they can get to their doctor and possibly be diagnosed. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. I really think this is so important to really highlight um, you know, a neglected disease for women's health. So thank you so much for um, having me and um, speaking with me about endometriosis. Wow. My pleasure, Dr. Carrie Pluniak, our guest here on Open. I want to let you know now, if you want more information, please don't hesitate, hesitate to go visit the website at uh, montefiore.org. There you can find out about endometriosis and a whole lot more. And speaking of a whole lot more, guess what? We got a whole lot more open. Stay with us. We're coming up right after this.
welcome back to the show. Food Bank for New York City has been working to end food poverty in the five boroughs for over 36 years. Now, in addition to their services, the organization has also been one of the single largest volunteer income tax assistance programs uh, providers, I should say, in the city as well as in the nation. And we're pleased to have joining us uh, here on the show, the Vice President of Programs for Food Bank for New York City. We got Zach Hall with us. And uh, Zach, thank you for being with us. Pleasure to have you, Darren. Thank you so much. You know, from the outset, somebody hears Food Bank. Okay, we understand food. But then you turn around and you say income tax, and they're like, food, income tax, assistance, making the correlation. So talk to us about uh, why you feel that this, this combination is so important. Well, absolutely. So appreciate you spotlighting that. Uh, food Bank for New York City, we, uh, our core business is getting food to hungry people across the city. But we know if you're having an issue of affording food, you're probably having an issue of affording other things as well. So we have other programs and services designed to put money back in people's pockets. And that's where our tax program comes in, making sure we can save folks money on their refunds, but then also getting maximizing their refund uh, to put the money back in, in families' pockets. So that you can put food on the table, pay rent, pay bills, save money, et cetera. Yeah. So you have the volunteer income uh, tax program. And so talk to us about how they can get who qualifies, first of all, for this volunteer assistance. Absolutely. So, um, you know, New Yorkers, we, we, we qualify families who make $60,000 or less in 2021. So last uh, last calendar year. Um, and, you know, we have locations across the city. We can talk a little about how that works. But um, as long as you're, uh, you know, a resident of the city and able to, to you know, document your, um, your verify eligibility, we're able to, to, to certainly assist you in getting your taxes done for free. And when we talk about taxes being done for free, that's a, a help to so many people. Talk to us about the amount of people that you're seeing taking advantage of the program. Uh, what kind of numbers are you seeing? Absolutely. So this is our 20th year of operating our tax program. Um, we've served over 800,000 filers in those 20 years, producing about 1.3 billion, billion with a B dollars in refunds and saving filers an estimated $190 million in tax preparation fees. So we've been doing this at scale for quite a while. Um, in a given year, we serve probably around you know, 20,000 filers is what we're expecting this, this, uh, this filing season. Um, and really making sure we can maximize uh, refunds. And we're estimating we should probably, out of those 20,000 filers, create about $36 million in refunds. So you have these people who come to file, but I know that part of the work that you're able to do is through the hands of volunteers. Uh, how many volunteers do you have uh, helping you to be able to do this? Because without them, of course, this doesn't happen. Absolutely. Thank you for highlighting those folks, because it is a generous, um, time uh, uh, investment in our program. We have about 250 volunteers uh, and some more staff that we leverage across the city to produce uh, all this free uh, tax assistance. So it's tens of thousands of hours of, of support from volunteers. Um, we saw a huge uptick in volunteering last tax season when we were um, you know, remote and, and COVID was still a real presence. Uh, in the city, and we um, allowed folks to volunteer remotely, so folks were able to stay at home or on their lunch break or wherever it was, uh, and provide some hours of volunteer service securely, safely, you know, through the power of the internet, uh, all supported by our trained uh, staff that we have, you know, 40 to 50 years of experience doing this on, on the team. Yeah. And you've also got, uh, as part of the tax filing process, uh, that child tax credit. Somewhat complex, but uh, there are some things that filers do need to know, correct? Absolutely. So child tax credit was a, a huge um, uptick this year, um, passed with the American Rescue Plan, allowed for anybody with um, uh, a dependent child, uh, even if they earn zero income in 2021, they're able to get um, that advanced child tax credit, which was half of uh, the year's credit in, in the form of a check that started uh, starting in July through December. Um, those checks stopped in January, but folks can still get the remaining balance of that credit by filing their taxes. That's a critical component now. So 
you know, if you if you have a dependent uh, child in the house or more than one, um, file your taxes. You know, if you didn't qualify uh, or meet the IRS threshold for filing your taxes before, file your taxes. It's the most important thing you can do. Uh, we can help you do that for free. If you haven't done your taxes in a few years, file your taxes because um, you're, you could be leaving money on the table if you don't. And then the IRS uh, will provide the remaining balance of that advanced child tax credit in the form of a tax refund. Yeah, I was looking at some statistics that you have and uh, it's pretty interesting demographic. 65% of your filers last year were women, 40% African-American, 40% Hispanic and Latino, uh, and 21% of those actually just speak Spanish solely. Um, and 40% uh, are age 60 and older. Uh, any surprise in the numbers that you were seeing? No, not really. That's kind of the, the typical demographic of the filer uh, of the clients we serve across the board with our SNAP program, uh, getting folks connected to, to food stamp benefits and other benefits and services across the city that we serve. But, you know, I've got a mom and I've got a wife and, and women get the job done. So we, we see uh, women come into our, our tax services in higher uh, amounts than, than men. And, you know, we have our, our goal really is to provide access. So we have um, uh, lots of dozens of organizations across the city who we partner with in uh, areas that may be underserved by financial services and certainly where there may be pred predatory uh, tax services out there. And we, and we make sure we're, we're in those pockets and serving the community and getting folks connected to this, this valuable and free service. Yeah. And for the average uh, time or wait for a person to be able to come on in and do this, uh, what's the time frame from the time they walk in the door to walking out of the door? Well, we have a multitude of services. So you're talking about our in-person appointment-based uh, appointment based services. Those are about an hour. Um, we also have, if folks can't find, we have uh, one at least one in-person location per borough. But then we also have drop-off locations where folks can submit their tax documentations. It's reviewed, scanned into our secure server. And then um, we have volunteers and staff off-site prepare those over the internet and, and file those on behalf of those folks. We have dozens of those locations across the city. Um, and that, that typical appointment is maybe 10 or 15 minutes to, to submit your documents there. And then it, it'd be probably about a week to maybe 10 days if it's get really busy for that uh, full filing to be completed. Amazing. And for people who want more information in terms of taking advantage of this uh, opportunity, how do they go about doing that? Absolutely. You can visit our website. It's the best way to get uh, make an appointment, look at up all of the other uh, locations across the city. We also have locations in which you can take charge and file yourself with the assistance of a tax uh, expert on site. Um, but folks can visit foodbanknyc.org slash tax help. Much needed information there. And uh, what's the deadline? Is there a deadline in terms of trying to get in touch with you guys for this? Absolutely. The filing deadline this year is uh, April 18th. Um, and that's a deadline if you owe money, if you may expect to, to not owe or even receive a refund. Um, there is some time after that deadline that you're able to file. And we would expect to have uh, some level of services uh, after that eight, uh, April 18th deadline, but not as the same scale because some partners partners aren't able to, to operate, but don't delay, file and make an appointment as soon as possible. The best uh, plan is to get, um, get your taxes completed by April 18th. All right, Zach, much needed information there. Thank you for the help that you're doing. Uh, you said over a billion dollars people have actually been able to receive uh, in refunds through these volunteers. And I think that's amazing because uh, you, you, know, you never know just how many people actually need a helping hand. So thank you for uh, all the great work. Absolutely, Darren. Appreciate you and BronxNet for, for shining light on this important service. And go file your taxes, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah, very important. Please file your taxes. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, Zach Hall, thank you so much for being with us. And I want to let you know, if you want more information, don't hesitate to visit their website at foodbanknyc.org. And then, of course, you can follow them on social media at foodbank4nyc. Well, we've come to the end of today's show. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us and most of all, the you, you, the viewer, for tuning in. And uh, if you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recablecast on Broxess Channel 67 or Verizon Files. That'll be Channel 2133 or anytime on the web 
at bronxnet.org. Also want to thank our viewers who've been sharing and watching with us on Manhattan Neighborhood Network as Open is broadcast live simultaneously on the MNN channel. Now, if you desire a brand new episode of Open, I want you to come back on Friday morning. My girl Rita Valentine will be back with the latest in arts and entertainment. Until then, I'm Darren Jaime saying take care, God bless, most of all, keep this channel wide open.